OK, so that data gives for us what's called a scattering diagram in the real vector space associated to um, N. <clears throat> That's the space where you would draw the fan of the toric variety. So what's a scattering diagram? Well, it's a set, collection, of walls. So there's um, the support of a wall. That's what I'm writing by this uh, Gothic D. So that's just um, a real co-dimension one cone in, um, in the uh, vector space NR. And so uh, we fix, um, just choose a sign here, so we fix an element of the dual which annihilates the cone. So it's determined up to a sign. <coughs> okay. Um, so what's this F? So that's a function that's attached to the wall. Um, to define that, first of all, I need to have a vector. So there's a vector in the, in the lattice N. And it has this property. So if you apply the skew form on N corresponding to um, <coughs> the uh, holomorphic two form on U, that's a multiple of N, this, this M up here. Uh, in particular, just notice, since this is skew, in particular, V does lie in the, the hyperplane M per, the linear span of this wall D. <clears throat> okay, and so then my function is basically a polynomial in the corresponding character Z to the V on the dual torus. So here the dual torus is N dual tends to C star, and we always write M for N dual. So the characters of the dual torus are M dual, in other words, N. So this should be thought of as a character on the dual torus. So we take a polynomial in that variable, and we add some formal parameters, T1 up to TR, to control convergence issues. And we take the completion, so that's what this hat denotes, with respect to these, these parameters, TI. <coughs> OK, and so what you should think of is this is a function in the global functions on the mirror torus, the, the, the dual torus T dual, but we've had to work um, introduce these parameters, so really it's that poor torus cross with um, an affine space with parameters ti, and then we're completing with respect to the ti. <coughs> okay, and so the direction of the wall is minus v, so that's just sort of a part of the notation. Okay, and so associated to such a thing, if you give me a wall, I can write down an automorphism of the dual torus, and it's given by this formula uh, which I wrote down last time. So if you take a character on the dual torus, z to the u, so use a vector in n, then that's multiplied by a power of f given by this formula. So just pair u with this element m, which annihilates d. And so the sign uh, is arranged in the following way. So this is correct if you're going from m positive to n, m negative. And just as a reality check, I <laughs> should have written this down last time, but I didn't. Here's the sort of simplest possible example. So I'm in the plane, and the wall is the, is the x-axis. I'm writing down the function 1 plus tx. So x and y um, are characters of the dual torus. They're a, they're a dual basis. They're, they're a basis of this um, ambient lattice. So they're, they're a basis of n. This is a picture in n. <clears throat> And so this is a wall. If I put 1 plus tx on this wall, so that the monomial x points in this direction, it means the direction of the wall is the opposite direction to the monomial, this sign change here. Um, and if I choose to go from the upper half plane to the lower half plane, so my m would then be just um, given by the, um, the usual coordinates in the vertical direction. And so this... This formula will tell me that y is multiplied by 1 plus tx to the power 1. So that's the transformation. And you can see that's just the usual cluster transformation if you set t equals 1. You know, for t equals 1 or t equals some finite value. <coughs> okay. And so let me just say what we sort of discussed last time. So this does two things. The first thing is it counts holomorphic disks in U, ending on a Lagrangian torus fiber. And, you know, I should have said this last time as well. Um, if you don't like to talk about holomorphic disks, then you can really avoid that 
um, in many cases. So equivalently, so maps, holomorphic maps from P1 to this compact variety X, such that the inverse image of the boundary is a single point. So I shouldn't say equivalently, so that's sort of not a theorem, but at least in dimension two, that's sort of certainly strongly suggested by a work of Gross, Pandari, Pandy, and Siebert. <clears throat> okay, so that's the first thing it does, some sort of enumerative data on U, some kind of open Grom of Witten invariants. And the other thing it's doing, which we sort of saw here, is it encodes the gluing of the torus charts of the mirror. V is a union of the dual tori. <coughs> okay. And I also wanted to mention, so, you know, this scattering diagram is a very complicated object, but there's a very nice paper, which I already mentioned, a few seconds ago, Gross, Pandari, Pandy, and Siebert described it in the case of dimension two and related it to these Grom of Witten invariants. Dimension two, this is. So this is a very nice um, discussion of scattering diagrams in dimension two if you've never seen the concept before. So at this point, I want to give some examples. But before I do that, are there any questions at this point? Yeah. Oh, ours just a positive integer. Yeah. So we'll see in, in a moment, actually. More questions? OK. So let's give some examples of scattering. Oh, actually, before I do that, let me also mention one thing we did last time. So this konsevich soyman gross siebert lemma Um, what it tells you is, you know, how do you get a scattering diagram? What you do, well, um, how do you get a, a useful scattering diagram? So you start with an initial scattering diagram. And um, there's this assumption that the wall should be hyperplanes. And that gives you a unique a larger scattering diagram, so um, this D containing D in, such that all the walls in this new diagram are outgoing walls in a, in a way I made precise last time, such that the new walls are outgoing. And if you take the corresponding automorphism of the torus, for any loop, Uh, for any loop. And you've got some complicated scattering diagram. I take a loop, composing the scattering automorphisms, I get some automorphism of the dual torus. I want that to be the identity. It's saying that when I do this gluing, it's consistent. So you get a, a unique diagram with that property. <coughs> okay, so. Basically, what's going to happen in our context is we're going to be given an initial diagram uh, corresponding to the uh, toric model of our cluster variety. So for us, the in is given by the data for the toric model. Let me just explain. So first of all, what is it? Let's write it down very simply. Just take all the hyperplanes mi perp, 1 plus ti, z to the vi. So I'll tell you in a moment what these m's and v's are. So for each m and v, what do I do? So I remember, how, how does the toric model look? I start with x bar. This is a toric boundary divisor. Let's call it c, as usual, a component of the toric boundary. That's the... Um, component of the toric boundary d bar corresponding to the vector v in n. Just as usual, if you have a array um, in n, that corresponds to a boundary divisor of your toric variety. <coughs> okay, and then remember we took inside that divisor a co-dimension 2 subset z, and that was given by an equation given by a character. So if I use this notation z to the m for the character associated to an element m, this is just the 
locus where that character is equal to some scalar lambda, and I do a blow up. And so what the picture is, at least this is sort of, you know, of course I'm drawing dimension two, but in general the, um, the picture just looks the same, except there's a product with a trivial direction. So I'll get the strict transform of this divisor given by the character, and I'll get some exceptional divisor. <clears throat> so what's happening here is, you know, if I sort of draw a um, slightly more faithful picture, so let, let's uh, assume we're in dimension two. So this is a CP1, and here I've got a, a, a copy of C, and these are my disks, which are, which are corresponding to the, so this is the disk uh, corresponding to this wall. So we have m perp and 1 plus t to z to the perp. <clears throat> so you just write down a bunch of walls which correspond to these disks, uh, which are generated by the, um, by the construction of the Turing model. And if you draw this in n, so the picture in N is that, um, <clears throat> you know, so if I draw this picture, it's sort of rather a bit more boring. You know, you've got the hyperplane in M, M perp, corresponding to oops, um, the zero locus of this character, Z to the M, or rather, you know, the, this, sorry, not the zero locus, the, the, um, this translate of the hypertorus z to the m equals 1, tropically that corresponds to just the hyperplane m perp. And you've got this um, direction v, remember, so that's inside. That's pointing towards the divisor. You know, that's the, if you think about it tropically, it's pointing towards the divisor in the, um, that, that, that this disk um, sort of comes from. <coughs> And so the direction of the wall, which is minus v, is the, is the direction in which the, disk, uh, the disk's area increases. So somehow it's the opposite of this direction. If you go in this direction and you change the Lagrangian, you want this disk to end, the area of the disk is increasing. That's, that's the meaning of the direction of the wall. <coughs> okay. So that's, that's what we're going to plug into this uh, konsevich soizman lemma. I'm going to get some, some crazy scattering diagrams out of it. So somehow the initial data, however, is completely trivial. But the scattering diagram produces um, some rather amazing uh, data. So let's see the examples. <coughs> so the first example is going to correspond to just taking uh, this cluster variety. So just take P2. This will be my toric model x bar d bar. I blow up two points. <clears throat> so that's a very simple cluster variety. Um, so what does the scattering diagram look like for that guy? <clears throat> so let me first draw the initial diagram. like this. So I've got two uh, walls to begin with, and these are the directions, these arrows. This is 1 plus t1 x inverse, 1 plus t2 y inverse, where again I've chosen x and y to be a basis of my of a lattice in this vector space. <clears throat> and so a short computation shows that if you add one ray in the direction 1, 1, and with attached function 1 plus t1, t2, x inverse, y inverse, then that's got the consistency property. So this is the, uh, this is the um, scattering diagram associated to that initial scattering diagram. <clears throat> and maybe let me just say, so what's the picture, enumerative picture? So again, you think about these incoming rays as corresponding to two disks like this. 
And what you're doing is, roughly speaking, gluing on a cylinder like that and perturbing so that this disk becomes holomorphic. So you get some disk that looks like this. So this is the new disk associated to this wall here. And if you don't like holomorphic disks, you can do this in algebraic geometry as well. Okay, so I'm, I'm blowing up this, these two points. Let's look at the line that goes through those two points. So I'll draw it as a kind of amoeba. Just the line. I guess you don't normally draw the line through PQ in that way. But. Okay, now I blow up those two points, P and Q. And you, know, you see this disk. Well, actually what you see is you see a P1 in the interior. That's just the strict transform of L. And the disk is obtained by just truncating. <clears throat> so that sort of explains what's happening in this picture from an uh, enumerative point of view. Okay, and so if you see, see that example, you might think, oh, well, this is going to be easy. You know, it's very simple. But um, very quickly, you realize that scattering diagrams can be um, much, much worse. <coughs> so let's see another example. <coughs> so just sort of slightly change what I did. So example two, just blow up two points on each boundary divisor. Okay, and so in terms of the scattering diagram, what's happening? Now I've just changed this, so I've got two factors on each um, ray. So this will be 1 plus T1x inverse times 1 plus T2x inverse. And similarly on the y-axis, so 1 plus... <coughs> And so, for simplicity, let's just set all the t's equal. I just want to try to give you the flavor of this diagram. So what does this diagram look like? <coughs> well, first of all, there are infinitely many rays, <coughs> like this. We do still have that ray of um, uh, slope one, but we also have rays approaching that from both sides. So infinitely many rays approaching this given ray. And so explicitly, what are the rays? Take these, these guys. So in the discrete part of the diagram, the functions are simple as before. And the symmetric ones on the other side. <clears throat> and we've got this one ray that's kind of um, more exciting. So this has a touch function, which is a power series. And you know, just, just um, if you want to expand, it's a power series with positive coefficients. using the binomial theorem. So this, this uh, function attached to this array is really um, is a, is a power series. It's not an algebraic function. Well, I mean, it's an algebraic function, but it's not a, it's not a polynomial. <coughs> uh, so maybe I just mention, uh, you know, at least, remember one thing I did say last time, was that although this diagram isn't finite in general, there is finiteness if you reduce mod t to the n for some n. So, you know, so mod t to the l, it'll be finite. Meaning, 
you know, for, the, for all but finitely many walls, the function will be congruent to one, and the automorphism will be trivial. That's a general property of how these diagrams are defined. Okay, and so one more example, actually two more, but one will be very quick. So example three, okay, so now let's go, go one more, so let's just take M blow-ups on, uh, on, each, on each component. And let's say, you know, now M, M at least three. So what happens is if you look at this diagram, So you have the same picture as before in, in for m equals 2, but you have some discrete series approaching this wall. I won't give the exact formulas, but you can. Somehow it's very easy to understand the discrete part of the diagram. Okay, but there's now, these arrays now are irrational. So this is sort of... Um, chi, it's irrational, quadratic irrational. Uh, something like this. <clears throat> um, but inside this irrational cone, what Mark uh, Gross likes to call the badlands, we, uh, we have almost no control. So in the cone, in this cone, what we expect is that every rational rate appears. And, um, you know, the functions are a power series. Somehow that's, that's a part of the diagram that's very difficult to analyze explicitly. <clears throat> okay, and let me give one, one final example. I won't say much about it in detail. But again, it looks like a pretty innocuous example from some points of view. So take now P2. And I do two blow-ups on each line. So this is um, a cubic surface with a triangle of lines. <clears throat> so that's our XD. And then in this case, here, so what's the, the initial scattering diagram? It looks like this. So I just choose the usual, uh, let's say I choose the fan for P2 like this. Um, okay, so then my, my rays look like this. My, my initial walls look like this. The opposite direction. Um, this is one plus, oh, I'm sorry, so. Uh, yes, so this is one plus T X inverse. 1 plus ty inverse, and 1 plus t x inverse y inverse, or oh, maybe xy. So that's your initial diagram. And so you, you scatter, you get the scattering diagram d, and here every rational ray appears. So this is even worse than the one we just saw. Somehow... <laughs> You know, there's no good region of the scattering diagram. After you scatter, every rational ray appears with some power of t. Okay. So that's just a... That's right, that's right, yeah. It's part of the definition, yeah. Okay, are there any questions at this point? Um, so I, I'm, remember, I'm blowing up two points on each of the three divisors. Earlier, I was only blowing up on the on two of the divisors. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So now I want to talk about. Okay. So let's. What we're trying to do is use this diagram to produce these global functions on cluster varieties. Uh, so first of all, I need to describe a mirror construction for cluster varieties due to Fock and Goncharov. This is work of Fock and Goncharov. Uh, 
And I want to immediately give a warning. Uh, this is really only valid in special cases, so not always valid. And we expect it's OK if our variety u is affine. I'm going to start with a cluster variety u. If this is not an affine variety, this um, description needs um, modification. <coughs> OK, so what is it? Start with my u. And it's going to be mirror to v, which is y, y minus e. The same, in the same way. So u is a union of tori. V will be a union of the dual tori. <coughs> and, you know, um, let's just recall the notation. So here T is N tends to C star. And dually T dual is the dual. Uh, M tends to C star. Uh, what's the other data that comes into a cluster variety? So there's a holomorphic two form. Sigma bar in wedge two MC. This is the holomorphic two form on you. Or strictly speaking, its restriction to T. <clears throat> and on the mirror side, so remember I assume this guy was non-degenerate, so I can just take the corresponding form. By which I mean, you know, uh, apply sigma um, after identifying the two lattices using, using sigma. So we're assuming non-degenerate. <clears throat> okay, and so, so what happened? So we had these gluing mutations on this side. So this is, tells me how to glue the charts together. It's given by an element M of M and V of N. <clears throat> M is in M, V is in N. And they're related in the usual way, so they must be related like this for some scalar nu. <clears throat> but it's got this very simple formula. And so, um, again, if we write it in this invariant fashion, it's just that mu upper star of z to the alpha is z to the alpha times 1 plus z to the m times the pairing of alpha with v for alpha an element of M, in other words, a character of T. So this is just the usual cluster mutation in, uh, without choosing coordinates. OK, but now it's sort of easy to see. I'm supposed to write down some dual uh, gluing on the other side. Anybody got any ideas? Maybe this is a bit fast, but look, this is determined by an element of M and an element of N, these dual lattices. All that happens on the other side is those two lattices are reversed. So you can just switch to say this is going to be given by mu of Nm, or v, sorry, Vm. And the only thing uh, I want to say is it's actually, it's convenient to put a sign in here. But, um, so you just switch V and M, and I'll explain later the sort of sign convention that makes it Nat, let's put a minus there. <coughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so that's that's uh, the Fock Gontrov mirror of a cluster variety. So now I want to talk about a rather surprising fact that if you think about it the right way, if you look at the scattering diagram of a cluster variety, you do have a discrete part of the diagram, uh, just as we did in this example, example three. There's some nice part of the diagram which is discrete. <clears throat> so for cluster varieties. After
after some work, after passing to a related an auxiliary variety, um, the scattering diagram D has a discrete region. So, of course, that's a bit vague, but what I'm trying to say is you can somehow reduce to this kind of case where you have a nice part of, of the diagram. <clears throat> okay, so the, the, working towards that, let me um, explain how that works. So, let's assume um, the following condition. If I look at the log two forms on my variety XD, that's just one dimensional. So it's generated by our, our given form sigma. So in the compact case, this will be what we called an irreducible holomorphic symplectic variety or hyperkähler manifold. And it's sort of understood by the so-called Bogomolov decomposition theorem that this is the essential case. And so that should be true in the non-compact case as well. In fact, it should be substantially easier. <clears throat> okay. So we'll assume that, but then a sort of short calculation of the way that you constructed the cluster variety means that this forces a sigma to be rational. Up to, up to scale. So when, you know, this is a form with... Um, with constant coefficients on the torus, we can assume that that's actually rational. And so scaling, so we can assume this is just in wedge 2m. So I don't know if you remember a long time ago, Don complained that the condition looked rather strange. So now I'm, I'm sort of going to this uh, more special case where that, that form is integral. It's not, it's not a complex valued form. <coughs> okay. So in this case, remember we had this condition between the M's and the V's. This condition here. So where, where nu is some multiple. But now this is a rational number. And we can assume, uh, replacing M with minus M, that it's positive. So let me just say, what's this m goes to minus m? Remember, how did m enter? It was, you know, we had a... Sorry, do you have a question? Oh, we may assume. I'm sorry. <laughs> you obviously weren't educated in Cambridge. <laughs> They're very fond of their willogs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, we may assume. <clears throat> and so, yeah, the point is, how did m enter? It was, give, you know, we're just writing down... Um, uh, a divisor, uh, you know, using a character. But of course, I can just, in, you know, this is a, this is a non-zero scalar. I can just, you know, take the inverse character. So I can assume this positivity. This will be important um, in a moment. <clears throat> so if you make this assumption and you do a short calculation using the scattering diagram theory, so now scattering calculation... implies that for all walls, remember you've got this rational polyhedral cone inside a, a wall defined by some, uh, um, inside a hyperplane defined by some element of, of M, we have, again, choosing the sign of M appropriately, this is just a positive combination of the initial walls, of the initial M's. So, if these guys are linearly independent, what we get is, um, you know, the sum region, which is completely outside the scattering diagram. Well, C plus, and there's also C minus, of course, and the scattering diagram, wherever it, whatever it is, is in this other region. We get a chamber. in the scattering diagram D. <clears throat> so it tells you that 
you know, we're in this nice situation where there's some part of the diagram which is nice. <coughs> okay, but it's better than that, because now we can look at another Taurus chart. <coughs> oh, sorry, before I do that, I actually have to say, I made this big assumption. So, for instance, this guy wasn't true. In the last case, I, I drew the last example of, of the cubic surface where it was everywhere dense, the diagram. So obviously that, that did not satisfy this condition that these three vectors were linearly independent. <coughs> okay, so um, <coughs> how can we reduce to this case? This is a two universal constructions. Okay, so I start with, um, so the point of these will be that we can assume that these are linearly independent. So why? <clears throat> okay, so what you do, I'm gonna make a, a, a mild assumption just to make this discussion a little bit easier. So let's assume for simplicity. When I look at this, um, A map, z to the r goes to m, just given by the vectors mi. <clears throat> but this is subjective. And of course, if you're a geometry, you'd like to know what on earth does that mean? And it's actually completely equivalent to requiring that the mirror, the thought gunter of mirror is, um, has h1 equals zero. So simply, actually, It'll, it'll be simply connected. <coughs> okay, but now associated to this map, there are two maps of tori. So on the one hand, if you just tensor this map with C star, I'm getting a subjection uh, from C star to the R onto T dual. Uh, alternatively, if I dualize this map, so the kernel, the co-kernel is torsion, um, I dualize this map and tensor by C star, that's an injective map by, by this assumption, and so I get an injection of T into C star to the R. <clears throat> yeah, so this map's just given by tensor by C star, this map's given by HOM into C star. <clears throat> okay, but now associated to those things, you can just do those, uh, do that construction for each torus, and you'll glue to get embeddings of U in some script U. So remember, U is just a union of tori. Similarly for V, union of T dual. Um, and for V, yes, I'm going to get a cover. Let me call it v, v tilde, maybe. Which, on each torus chart, is just given by this, this map. So what are these maps? OK, so here, uh, what's happening is this is the universal deformation. Of U. So remember, U, when you define the cluster variety, you blew up some uh, translates of hypertori in the boundary divisors. But of course, you can move the position of the hypertorus. You can vary this parameter lambda. And this is exactly what this family is doing. It's just saying this is the total space of the deformation of U you get by varying those lambdas in all possible ways. <coughs> and here, this is uh, also a universal construction. It's what's called the universal torsor. of V. Um, so what's the best way to say that? Uh, basically what you do is just take the Picard group of V, actually by our assumption it's a torsion-free abelian group, take a basis of line bundles, and you just take the uh, C star bundle, or C star, I guess, what is it, to the R minus N, bundle, given by those, uh, that basis of the Picard group. So it's sort of a, the, the universal tor torus bundle over V in some sense. <clears throat> yeah, and so some, if, if you know this sort of theory, it's sort of related to this Cox ring construction. Um, so it's same kind of thing. <clears throat> okay, but the point is, why did I do this? I can now pass to these other two um, cluster varieties. So these are again cluster, and U is mirror to V tilde. So I can sort of reduce to this case.
Uh, yeah, and the point being, uh, you know, so what I'm trying to do at the moment is construct global functions on V, um, but what I'm actually going to do is construct global functions on V tilde, and then, you know, the, the functions I want on V will be some, some invariant functions under this torus action. So everything will be equivariant for the torus. I can just take the invariant functions, get my canonical basis on V. <coughs> and so, of course, in this case, you know, the MI now are just a basis of the corresponding uh, M tilde. <coughs> Oh, good point. Thank you. Yeah, I meant to say that. So, no, notice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I was always assuming this non-degeneracy. Now we've lost non-degeneracy. So, of course, what you do is the form is just pulled back. You know, sigma tilde is just a pullback. Or maybe this is sigma tilde dual. So now, you know, this is no longer non-degenerate. And here, you know, I can have my sigma, uh, sigma on u, it's not even a form anymore. It's a relative form, you know, relative to form. So, you know, it's well defined on each fiber, but it's not. It's not. Doesn't come from a global two form on U. <clears throat> and you know, on each fiber, it, it'll still be holomorphic symplectic. But you know, you sort of moved out of this. Uh, so we've moved away from this assumption where sigma is non-degenerate. But you know, actually, um, that doesn't cause any trouble with this scattering diagram. You can still can still apply our method. <clears throat> so, so I should say, so, so earlier somebody asked, you know, um, why do you assume it's non-degenerate? And I, I just feel that the mirror symmetry is more um, transparent if you phrase it that way. But, you know, in the cluster literature, they, they never assumed this form was non-degenerate. And so somehow they were always working, tend to work with these, these varieties up here. So in terms of Fock gontrov notation, Um, this script U is what they call X, and V tilde is what they call A. <clears throat> you know, so these were the, the varieties that were sort of classically studied, well, well classically, you know, at the, by Fock and Goncharov and Fermin Zelovinsky, um, initially in the sort of development of cluster theory. <clears throat> okay. Oh, it's, uh, you can say explicitly, I mean, it's just you took... It's just the quotient, right? So C star to the R modulo T. Um, so, you know, what this means is you choose your lambdas in here, which give you the positions of the hypertori in the boundary. But then you quotient by T. That's the automorphism group of the toric variety. So, you know, this is, this is like the moduli space. <clears throat> okay. All right. So now we can go back to um, this chamber decomposition and talk about the cluster complex. So at the moment, we have one cluster chamber, this C plus, but we can get more by doing mutations. <clears throat> so the support of this diagram will be invariant under mutation. Um, so remember what we had is you know, if I have a mutation of two tori, then I get an associated tropical, tropicalization, which is a piecewise linear map um, between the corresponding um, real vector spaces, so, you know, associated to N, ZPL, <coughs> some kind of shear. Um, and what I'm saying is that, you know, so I could have built so this corresponding, maybe I should call this T prime or something. So these are two copies of, of the same torus T corresponding to different toric models. I get this piecewise linear transformation. Now, if I took those toric models, I would build two different scattering diagrams, D and D prime. And what I'm claiming is if I apply the tropicalization map, I mean, there's some change in the attached functions, which is fairly minor. But at least if I just look at the support, the two things are the same. And, you know, heuristically, that comes from this enumerative interpretation that they're both counting the same things. They're counting these holomorphic disks or, or if you like, P1s meeting the boundary in a single point. So somehow, this really comes from the enumerative interpretation, at least heurist heuristically. At least heuristically. Of course, the way we prove it is you actually just check, check it's true. Um, 
Okay, but now, uh, so, so now when you do this, you know, you see that what happens is you, you sort of produce a whole collection of chambers, one for each cluster torus in the scattering diagram. So let me just sort of draw the picture. So I have my C plus. So here's C plus. Uh, let's apply this tropicalization of mu. What happens is, well, one of the hyperplanes, you know, the new, the new C plus, maybe it's right here, is, um, this is a C plus prime, is adjacent. So one of the hyperplanes, and it's just, of course, the, the hyperplane corresponding to the, the, um, you know, the choice of um, divisor of which you um, mutate along. <coughs> So what you get is you get the cluster complex delta inside D. So this is a simplicial fan. And the cones correspond to the cluster tori. <clears throat> OK. And so, you know, again, so going back to the example we, we drew earlier, this is the picture you should have in your mind. There's some nice part of the diagram where everything's sort of trivial. You know, the, the attached functions are sort of really obvious. Um, and those are just corresponding to these cluster charts. And then there's some part of the diagram where we have absolutely no idea what's going on. But there is this nice part, that's the cluster complex. <coughs> okay, but now we can build our, our um, mirror manifold using the scattering diagram. We just say, take V, the union of the T-dual over the um, chambers in the cluster complex. <coughs> um, and we're just going to use the scattering functions. So you know, if I want to glue two guys, you know, the scattering diagram tells me how to do that. And notice, you know, so these, these, as I said, these functions, when you set T equals 1, they're just the usual cluster transformations. So there's no problem because these functions aren't power series you know, in this region. That the functions are, are, are the simple functions we've seen already. <clears throat> so, you know, here I guess I'm setting pi equals 1, or if I want um, a general cluster variety, just take ti is some, some constant you know, corresponding to the choice of the positions that I blow up. <clears throat> and so this is just the same construction as, as before. in a different interpretation. So just the usual construction of a cluster variety obtained by gluing tori together. <clears throat> okay, so what have we gained? So there's this whole part of the diagram that's kind of totally nuts, um, but we haven't used it yet. <laughs> now, now, now we're going to use it. <clears throat> okay. So this is the notion of broken lines. And again, let me say, so what I talked about yesterday, this is some version of the symplectic um, heuristic we discussed. So I've got a fiber of the SYZ fibration. I've got a point in the base, you know, corresponding to the fiber. I've chosen a boundary divisor, C in my boundary. And what I'm trying to do is count holomorphic disks that end on this L, and they're going to intersect um, the divisor D here with some contact order. <clears throat> this is a holomorphic disk. Count these, and we get some global functions. Uh, theta, I think I called it theta C comma N. This was in H0. So global function on the mirror. And this, I should have said, this is, of course, remember, this is a picture of the, of the original variety. So now I want to sort of translate that into, into our picture. <coughs> this is the notion of a broken line. <coughs> so we need some data. So first, we're just going to take any non-zero vector in our lattice N. Oh, bother. <laughs> <clears throat> OK, and in terms of the data over there, maybe I just say, so of course, if I have any non-zero vector, 
I can write it as an integer m times a primitive vector. So that's what these, uh, this data over there will be. So m will be the contact order of the disks with the boundary divisor, and the boundary divisor is given by, well, it's the one corresponding to this, this primitive vector. So you have your toric variety. Um, after blowing up, you can assume that this is part of the fan, this ray, and there'll be a boundary divisor corresponding to that vector. <coughs> okay, and we're gonna choose a point P in NR, so that's be a general point. And again, that's the same thing as over there. It corresponds to the point, choice of the point in the base, SYZ, the SYZ base. Um, at least, you know, the tropical version of that. <coughs> okay, so just give a definition. So a broken line for V with endpoint P So it's a piecewise linear object. So it's a map from the negative uh, real axis, real, real interval, to NR. <clears throat> so continuous and piecewise linear. Um, <clears throat> together with, for each linearity domain, an attached monomial. Um, so where does this monomial live? So I'll write C sub L times Z to the VL. And CL is in our coefficient ring. So C, but we've adjoined these formal parameters, T1 up to TR. And V is uh, just an element of N. This is a character on the dual torus. <coughs> Okay. Okay, so the, satisfying the following properties, so such that, so first of all, the initial monomial is just given by V. So that's, that's how this thing starts. <coughs> and so for every um, linearity domain L <coughs> and any point in L, you look at the derivative of um, this, uh, you know, the, the direction of the path, this is given by the negative of the vector V. So that's the usual thing about the direction being the opposite of this vector V. <coughs> the wall crossing, so now what happens if I try to cross a wall? Let's say I'm going in this direction. This is L and L prime. <coughs> and let's say the, the wall crossing automorphism here is theta. Then what do you do? So it's the obvious thing. You start with CL, Z to the L, or Z to the VL. You apply theta and just pick out one monomial term. So in here, this is just C, CL prime, Z to the VL prime, just a monomial. Just to expand this um, thing in a power series, um, take, take, take a monomial. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so maybe I just draw this previous thing. So remember, this is, this is VL, and then it changes in this way. <clears throat> Okay, and so let's just draw, uh, oh, sorry, finally, one more question, one more thing. It's got endpoint P, of course. So gamma zero is P. Okay, but what's the picture? So, you know, it's just some piecewise linear picture. It's very simple. Here's my scattering diagram. I'll just draw some part of it. Here's my gamma. It comes in like this, hits some walls, bends, ends at P. 
And, you know, so here, this is the direction V. That's how, that's how the thing starts. And so it starts with, you know, the attachment monomial here is Z to the V, but it becomes more complicated as you apply these wall crossing translations. <clears throat> and, you know, so again, this is something we've sort of seen before. If you, <laughs> if you sort of um, believe the symplectic picture, what's happening is you, you start off with some holomorphic disk, so maybe draw it like this. So at infinity, it hits this uh, boundary divisor C. It comes in, it hits this wall, associated to this wall, there's some disk attached to the wall. You glue on that disk, that changes its direction. And then you glue on another disk when you hit the next wall. Changes its direction again. And then it ends on the SYZ fiber. So that's what it's supposed to be doing. Of course, we don't, we don't prove that that's correct, but that's, that's the heuristic. <clears throat> okay. So let's write M gamma for the final monomial. Okay, and now just following what the symplectic guys did, we just define uh, this local expansion of the theta function as the sum of these monomial terms over each gamma. <clears throat> so it's the local expression for this global function. And then what you can show, so this is work, uh, is that these actually give a global function. So you get theta v in global functions on this um, of the variety uh, V, the mirror. I'm sorry, so these are two Vs. This is a small V and this is a big V. <clears throat> so what I mean to say is, you know, this is the, uh, for P in a chamber, in a chamber of the cluster complex, this gives the restriction of theta v to uh, the corresponding torus. The dual, which is associated to that chamber. <clears throat> um, and I should say also, so I've also got to uh, say, assuming convergence. So at this point, if I want to get my v back, I have to set the ti some finite values. Okay, so that, but that's the construction. And now let me state our theorem. Uh, so the theorem, uh, this is um, with gross Uh, Kiel and Kosevich. So if you want to see on the archive, it's this paper. So this works, so H0, V, O, V. These are global functions, and they give a basis. Uh, if, so under one of the following conditions. So either... The first condition is that this cluster complex, so if you look at it in N, it's not contained in a half space. And the second condition, um, if you just work in the dimension two case. And it's affine. So what we expect is this, this, expect this is sort of optimal. Could you have five more minutes? I just wanted to give some examples. What does the chair think? Yeah, okay. okay. Actually, sorry, I should say to the audience, if you want to leave, that's fine. I don't care. <laughs>
stuff. <laughs> I'm just saying that it, it's horrible to give a state theorem and not give a single example. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, anyway. Um, okay. So just a couple of examples. So example zero, this is what's called finite type. Um, so these are, this was done by Fermin and Zelovinsky in 03. This, so so-called finite type cluster varieties. These correspond to uh, root systems or Dinkin diagrams, including the non-simply laced. So here, the cluster complex is the whole of D. So there's no, there's no bad region at all. And so the feta basis is just equal to uh, the basis that these guys knew, the cluster variables. And more generally, if I take a chamber in the cluster complex, and I take a point in that chamber, and I expand, you know, uh, I take a array in the chamber and expand, so you know, so here's. I'm in this situation, so I have a, uh, a point V that lies in a cluster chamber, I take a point in the chamber and expand, there's just a single broken line. And so what it shows you is that your theta function in that chamber, you know, so theta V restricted to this corresponding torus, is just a monomial. That's the cluster monomial. So there's some part of our basis that is just something that was already known, um, so-called, um, sorry, cluster monomials, I should say. <coughs> so it's a monomial in the cluster variables with positive, positive exponents. <coughs> so, so yeah, so in, in the finite type case, that gives you the whole basis. In general, it gives you some subset. <coughs> so example one, so this was worked out quite recently by Gross and, and some, some other guys. A lot of people, actually. So get, let's go back to the examples we started at, talking about at the beginning. So I have a bunch of points, M1 and M2, on the two um, coordinate lines in, in A2. And I blow up, that gives me my XD. So remember, the scattering diagram was insane. You know, some, some really nasty part here we know absolutely nothing about. Um, but nonetheless, you can prove in this case that the theta basis is, is something that was already known. It's what's called the greedy basis, which was described by uh, Lee, Lee, and Zelovinsky. And so the reference is, so it's Mark Gross and, and a bunch of other people. Um, uh, 1508. Okay, so that's, that's another example where everything is known. Unfortunately, all the examples where we know what it is, it's something that people already knew about, but, but presumably there are lots of cases where that's not true. Um, okay, so the final example. Let's go back to the cubic surface. Remember, this was the, this was the scattering diagram where like, every rational ray appears. What, what on earth are you going to do? Well, the point is that, again, uh, remember... When we, when, if, in order to see these chambers, you had to pass to this other associated variety. If you do pass to that, ver that other variety, there is some nice region, this uh, cluster region, where you can do, where you can work. And that gives you the result for the cubic. So let me just say what it is. So this is my XD. Very beautiful thing. And basically, this, in this case, it's due to Fock and Goncharov originally. So if you just look at the interior in this case, it's a fact. This is a moduli space of local systems. On the sphere with four punctures for the group, SL2C. And um, this depends on parameters. The parameters are given by fixing the traces, fixed traces of the monodromy around the punctures. So cubic surfaces depend on four parameters. Those are the four parameters in this, in this case, <coughs> in this interpretation. 
So yeah, so you can read about that if you're interested in a nice paper of Camtat and Loray. That's this archive preprint. <clears throat> and so in this case, what's the feature basis? It turns out that it's just the um, traces of the monodromy around simple loops. Simple closed curves in S2 minus four points. Um, possibly with a multiplicity. Meaning, you know, go around the loop several times. Um, okay, uh, so I should have said, yes, yeah, so this is sort of basically what happened is Fock and Goncharov knew this already. This is Fock and Goncharov. Um, this rather long paper, which is actually very readable. And what we did is just checked, oh, sorry, not, not me. Uh, this is uh, Sean Keel and Andy Neitsky uh, checked that this is the same thing. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you very much.